Hey you guys, it's Peter, and I'm back. And I'm not gonna do some cutesy intro today. Um, I really just wanted to get on here and talk to you guys. I'm very nervous about making this video. I've had to like restart it like three times because I keep on stuttering over my words. So I think this time I'm just gonna go with it and whatever happens, happens. Um, but this video is really important for me to make. And um, it's because today is the 24th anniversary of my sobriety birthday. I've been sober for 24 years as of today. And uh, December 17th, 1994, I don't know when you're watching this video, so in case you're watching this video down the road. And, um, you know, it's surreal to me. It's absolutely surreal. And I'll tell you what else is surreal, <laughs> is that uh, last night I had this moment when I was driving around in my car, and this is when I kind of decided that I was going to make this video today, because I've talked about recovery and addiction. I talk about it constantly in my videos. And it's like paramount to my personal life. You know, most of my friends are sober people. And, you know, I go to meetings. And all, so a lot of my personal life is about it too. But I was thinking today, I was like, I want to make videos on my channels about sobriety. I think it's important, you know. I think that it's something that I have talked a lot about. When I talk about people, YouTubers that are younger that I feel like are problematic or whatever because they scare me. They scare me with their behavior. I've lost a lot of friends. I've attended over 100 funerals easily in the 24 years that I've been sober. Easily. And in this last year alone, um... I feel as if, I, I can't even count how many people I know directly or indirectly, but like through somebody else that has passed away from opioid addiction or specifically heroin addiction. Um, and it just is, I mean, it's a heroin epidemic in our country and we don't want to talk about addiction because there's a stigma that goes along with it. You know, if you're a spouse of somebody, you weren't a good enough spouse. If you're a parent, well, you weren't a good enough parent. And we've got to destigmatize the disease of addiction. We've got to start talking about it honestly and being open about our stories. And not just me, but anybody out there, you know, parents, sisters, uncles, teachers, whatever, and, and talking about what they went through so that other people can say, because every time I talk about my sobriety in a video, every single time, I get five to 10 emails immediately saying, I so relate to this. Can you help me? And you know, blah, 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 whatever. And I will list some resources underneath here that are resources that I have stood by for, you know, 20 years or whatever. I'm, they're not sponsored. I don't get anything off of it. They're just to me, trustworthy resources for where you can find treatment options. Um, so, you know, I was sitting there last night, I was totally silent, and I was thinking about what had led up to my birthday this year, and it's been a weird year. It's been a weird year, it really has. I mean, I don't know what my higher power, and if you don't believe in that, hey, that's cool, you know, do your gig, but for me, I don't know what my higher power had planned for me this year, but my higher power had planned that I was gonna learn a lot of lessons this year, and it has been invaluable. I have learned, I have learned so much this year, and um, I'm really thankful for my recovery program that has allowed me to be open to that and taking a look at my shit and what I need to fix with me because at the end of the day, that's what it's about. And I'm only gonna be here once, okay? I mean, this is not a dress rehearsal. If you think it is, you figure it out quickly, okay? You know, people ask me all the time, if, if you could go back to your younger self and you could tell your younger self what to do, I would say, go back to my 18 or 20 year old self, I would say, Go move and live where you want to live. Write your book now. Do this, do that. Because listen, life is short. And the things that I can do now in my life, it's taken me, you know, 20 years to figure out that I could have done them then. I really could have with enough hard work and perseverance and living a right life. And I really do believe that living a right life part is important. Um, so kind of what happened was in the last month, I would say six weeks, um, I've talked a lot about this on my vlog. I've talked a lot about this on my Peterism's channel, which is like one of my channels that I would just talk about mo like meditations and daily affirmations and things like that. I really have been struggling on the time leading up to my sobriety birth date. And the reason why is every year at this time, I always struggle going up to it. Um, because I remember back a lot of what my life was like back then. And it was dark and it was ugly. And um, especially the last two months of my using... <clears throat> There is really not anything out there that I have not used, okay? I've used everything across the board, and in fact, I'm going to tell a story about my stepmom last night, because she's the one that took me into treatment in kind of a crisis mode situation, and um, there, were, like my drug history came up, and she had to walk out of the room because it was too much. The only substance I never used was heroin, because it was never offered to me, and I do believe that if it was offered to me, I would have used it. I also believe that if I was an active addict in 2018, I would be dead. I believe that. Um, we talk a lot about hitting our bottoms, 
I am not a person that believes that you have to hit your bottom. I'm a, pe I'm a person that believes that you can choose your bottom. I know for me, my bottom is death. I know that. If I continue to use, I will die from a disease of addiction. And I do believe that it is a disease. And fight with me all you want. Call up the American Medical Association because the American Medical Association has defined addiction as a disease comparable to any other disease. Um, and if you don't believe that, that's, that's cool. You know, like when people want to like argue with me about that, I'm just like, listen, I don't, I don't care to fight with you. I really want to help people get better. I want to tell my story to inspire people. I want to tell my story to motivate people. And really, honestly, at the end of the day, this video is for that one person out there sitting that day in and day out wants to stop, doesn't know how, and doesn't think that it is ever going to be possible. And I'm telling you that is absolute bullshit. You can do it. You can get clean and sober and you can turn your life around. And that's why I try to live my life openly on the internet today as a sober person so that I can show that. Um, I always wanted to win the lottery. And in fact, my dad used to joke with me um, because he would say to me, you know, you think that when you turn 18, you're going to win the lottery and you're going to go live in some beach house in Malibu and just hang out with all of your friends and, you know, whatever. And now I'm like, well, hell, if I had started YouTube 20 years ago, if it had been around, I would, that would be my life. You know what I mean? No. But anyway, um, I went over to my dad's house yesterday. It was my husband and I, my dad and my stepmom, and we were sitting around. And there was a Hallmark movie on in the background. This was not an exciting setting. And uh, my dad and my stepmom have a new dog, a little Yorkie. And we were, you know, playing with the dog and we were sitting there talking. And my dad and my stepmom were telling stories about what that, you know, last night was like for me. I said to them, I said, do you remember where you were uh, 24 years ago tonight? And my dad was like, I'll never forget. And, um, then my stepmom, she was the one that took me into treatment. And so, uh, and my dad said to me that day, he said, do you want to go to treatment or do you want to go to jail? Because see, I had plea bargained down two class D felonies for fraud. Um, that was a fake ID and using a fake ID. So I knew I was going to prison and like a smart addict, I knew I probably wouldn't make it there back then. So I said, I'll go to treatment. And, um, my stepmom took me in and I didn't remember part of this story last night when she was telling it. She said that they weren't willing to accept me to come into treatment. This was an inpatient treatment and it was like five o'clock in the morning. And she said, the woman said, um, he's not drunk enough to have him come in. At that point, I was drinking about uh, a fifth and a half or two fifths of Jack Daniels a day, plus two to three forties. Um, I used to drink like, um, Oh, the really cheap alcohol back then. I, well, Jack Daniels, but then like just to get me through the day, like Wild Irish Rose. You guys remember that? Like Old E, Colt 45. I loved 40s because they would get me drunk really quick. Um, I would drink really anything. But on top of that, <clears throat> I was eating about six to eight Vicodin in a day. I was smoking marijuana all day long. I was smoking crack cocaine and I was snorting cocaine. And, um, you know, I look back at all of that. There were other substances I used, you know, if they were offered to me, you know, but th that was what a day looked like for me. And, um, I remember getting up that day and I was going out with some friends that night and um, I remember sitting around the apartment and I had Charlie Brown's Christmas on and it was kind of like, I just would play it, rewind it. It was like VCR tape, play it, rewind it, play it, rewind it. And um, I used to love to drink in the shower and I would take, I would have like, you know, the bottle with me and I would go in the shower and I would drink after I'd taken like, you know, two Vicodin and then I would take two, you know, two hours later. And if you've been there, you know the gig. And um, then I would smoke weed. And I, by the time that I went downtown to be with my friends, they just thought I was normal, but it took me that much just to stop the shakes, to feel okay, to get the redness out of my eyes, to be back to normal again. It took all of that. At that point in my life, it was a lot of work just to maintain. My stepmom said that when they took me in, the woman that did my assessment, my evaluation, said he's not drunk enough to come in here. And my stepmom said, I know him, and he's in a blackout right now. I don't remember any of this. And a blackout is when you keep on functioning, but people think that you aren't in a, they're in a blackout. A pass out is when you just pass out. I was a blackout drinker, which meant almost every time I drank, I blacked out at some point and didn't remember things from the night before and whatever. And, um, the woman said, no, I'm telling you, he's not drunk enough. I can tell he's just sitting there. He's answering my questions. And my stepmom said, I know him. I know my kid. He, he's in a blackout right now. He's gone. And I said, well, what was I like? She goes, well, to me, you were zombified. You know, like I knew who you were like from drinking back then. I could just tell that you were so out of it. 
They gave me a blood alcohol level and I blew off the charts and the doctor later, who was a good friend of my dad's, told my dad, your kid should have been dead. He should never have made it through that. Like his BAL, was, his blood alcohol level was way too high. They started doing a drug history with me and my stepmom said to me last night, she said, you know, when I, by the time they got to the eighth or 10th drug, I had to walk out of the room. I just couldn't listen to it anymore. It was so painful for me. And through the years, I haven't, like, I've had a lot, tons of conversations with my dad and my stepmom about the way that I affected them. If you've watched my videos for a long time, you know, um, it's such a blessing. My mother, who passed away in 2008, just short of uh, one month sober, she got sober six months after I did. And, um, so we had almost 13 years together of sobriety and it just, the language of recovery has just been a constant in my life for 24 years. Um, so I went into treatment, not willingly. I didn't want to be there. I was the most resistant little shit that you have ever seen. Demanded to get out on numerous occasions. I had nowhere to go. And quite frankly, and I really, really believe this, if it weren't for my father setting limits and boundaries, now I want to make this very, very clear, okay? And this is, I get shit about this at times, but I, it's, it's important in case somebody out there is, uh, you know, relating to this. I was 22 years old. I was going to college that I had dropped out of. I, my dad did not know. He was paying for my apartment and he was basically paying for me to party. When I got out of treatment, when I was getting out of treatment because he worked so closely with the doctor. So basically what I was at 22 years old was a spoiled brat. And, um, what and I had no, I had no emotional development whatsoever. I was 22, going on about 18, if even 16 maybe. I had no clue how to take care of myself whatsoever. My dad had this strict like contract written into place, and I had had these behavior contracts before, right? I had had these contracts where it said if you don't do this and you don't get to do that and all this kind of stuff. So we go through this contract and. I don't remember the details, but it was like, go to a meeting every day, get a sponsor, call your sponsor every day. I'm allowed to talk to your sponsor. You know, you, this, you aren't, he, I wasn't gonna have any cash whatsoever. He bought me cigarettes and groceries and that was basically all I had. And you know, on and on and on. And he had all this stuff and I said, okay, well, where do I sign it? And he goes, you don't sign it. And I go, what do you mean? He goes, you don't sign it. You don't want to do it. Get the fuck out of my life. I'm done. And I go, excuse me. And he goes, don't do it. Don't do it. And if you use, leave your keys for your apartment in the apartment, walk outside, close the door, and leave my life. He goes, I'm so done with this. He goes, you have so damaged our relationship that you don't... And to this day, like, I have still, like, you know, there's no tension between my dad and I. But, like, I was sharing this the other day that, like, I got married in 2011. We got married in Las Vegas, Nevada. And my dad was there. My dad walked me down the aisle and gave me away. And my husband's mom, you know, walked him down and gave him away. And I, I, I think about things like that. Like, that never would have been possible if I was using today. You know, and I remember when I was going to Las Vegas, my dad said to me, he said, are you sure you want to get married in Las Vegas? He was like, is it going to be too dangerous for you, like with drinking and things? And I was like, dad, come on now. I've been sober, you know, at this time. Something ridiculous, like, you know, 18 years. I think I'm okay. In the last two years, I have lost a lot of friends of mine that um, have chosen to go back out there. Some of them are living, you know, very active lives. They're just living their active lives using drugs and alcohol. And I'm not part of that life anymore. Um, my life looks a lot different today than it did 10 years ago. It looks a lot different to me today than it did 24 years ago. But last night as I was sitting with my dad and my stepmom and my husband and their dog, and they're telling stories. And then those stories went into stories about past vacations. And those stories went into stories about, you know, my dad and my stepmom being proud of me, like for being a counselor and working in a treatment program and all of the things that I had done with my life. And that went to one, another thing and writing a book, you know, and my dad was like, I'm just really proud of you kids, you know? And this is not about pats on the back. The reason why that statement is so important to me that my dad says to me today, I'm so proud of you, kid, is because when I got sober and I went to him and I showed him my one-year token, he said to me, you know, something to this degree, I think it was, I think it was around my one year. He said, you're not a C becoming an A. You're an F becoming a C. You're just doing what everybody else is doing out there in the world. And that's right. And sobriety is not about pats on the back. And sobriety is not about accolades and all of that and sobriety is about getting your life back and as I sat there last night with my family I thought I really did kind of win the lottery you know 
Because 24 years ago, this wasn't possible. I couldn't have talked my way out of it. I couldn't have talked my way into that family. They wouldn't want me there. I wasn't invited for Thanksgiving that year to anybody's house, my mom's or my dad's. Nobody wanted me. Um, and I had done that to myself. I had ruined my own life. I had created the dark hole that I was living in. And um, today I don't have to live like that. For anybody out there that's struggling, you don't have to live this way. There are 12 step programs or, you know, religions that you can be part of that are healthy, not, you know, healthy religions. And, you know, there are treatment programs that you can go to. I choose to believe in a 12 step program and I choose to follow what is told to me to do in a 12 step program. And that's worked for me for 24 years. But I know for some people that doesn't work that way. And um, I think we've got to start talking about this. I think we're losing so many people every day to addiction and you know i was looking at the news and i just noticed that a couple days ago i think it was two days ago um the co-founder of vine passed away from a alleged overdose and i thought you know here's this young man that's so creative on top of the world and yet this addiction has taken him many people that struggle with addiction also struggle with mental health issues we have to destigmatize mental health and addiction in our country. We have to make treatment for mental health and um, addiction affordable. We have to allow people to get what they need, the resources met. We have to help them find those things. We have to stop enabling our loved ones. We have to stop just letting things be okay because we're afraid of losing a friendship over saying, I'm really worried about you. If if me saying to a friend, I'm really worried about you, is going to cost my friendship, I would rather their life be saved and then be upset with me than their life be gone and I never said anything. And I think that's where I have to live today. And um, for anybody out there that is really, really stuck struggling, please get some help. You can do it. You can... I just never thought this was going to be my life. I honestly did. And I, I've talked so much about this, you know, on my blog and in my Peterisms channel and on and on and on. And, but the thing is, is that there were two things I was completely convinced about in my life. Number one, I was never going to get sober. And number two, my mother was never going to get sober. I got sober in six months she did. And her getting sober had absolutely nothing to do with me. She got sober because my uncle had a mass, uh, massive heart attack and she decided that if she was going to live another day, another week, another year, another 10 years, she did not want to live continuing to drink the way that she did. And she wasn't even like, you know, she made it very clear. I wasn't sitting on street corners, but her drinking was bad and it affected me greatly when I was growing up. And I, I do identify today as a child, an adult child of an alcoholic. Um, I never thought I would get sober. Five attempts, and I finally got it the last time in treatment, and not because I wanted to, not because I wanted to be there. I'm not a believer that you have to have a whole hell of a lot of desire to walk into you know, a 12-step room or to walk into treatment and get it. You can be pushed through the door. You can have court holding it over your head. I have seen miracles happen with people that are court-ordered to treatment programs and 12-step meetings. I have seen miracles occur because court orders them to do that. You know, there's a saying that you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. And I do believe that. But I am also a believer in planting the seed and planting the seed of hope that anybody out there that is struggling with addiction can at one point say enough is enough and move on with their lives. I don't just have a great life today. I don't just have an awesome life today. I have a life beyond my wildest dreams. I love you guys. Thank you so much for watching my videos and I will see you tomorrow. Bye.